right, here we are at the game table, and let's get started. So, first thing that we're going to go over, here's the book, and of course, as I said, here's the characters that I have. Sorry about the shadow, guys, not a whole lot I can really do about that. Um... What I really wanted to get you to, when I do one of my own homebrews, first thing I want to do is do a random encounter table. Now, of course, these are all encounters out of the Palladium's Monster Manual. Uh, and what I do is I assign D100 chart and put the page number. So I don't have to worry about writing out all that stuff. I can just flip right to the page number and get all the information I need. Second thing I'm going to do for this little, um, my world, is I'm going to want to put some traps in there. So as you can see, I have two different trap selections. I got a pit and a spike pit trap. Okay, this is going to be my wilderness area. I'm going to use a 1d6 for that, 1 through 4 for my pit, 5 through 6 for my spike pit. And of course, their damage. The pit trap's 1d6 damage, and the spike pit trap is a 3d6. And then I put subterrain. Now subterrain is going to mean dungeon or any, well, subterrain. And I'm going to have an arrow trap, fire trap, acid trap, pit trap, and then a spike pit trap with all their damages there. So that just helps speed things up. It's already done. It's already in the game. Um, the second chart that I like to do for mine is I got ruins and weather and of course using my d100 table over here I put down here some of the stuff that um, I'm gonna expect to encounter in this area and we're gonna get into that area here in a minute and that's cave system with three areas abandoned cottage with 1d3 rooms abandoned mine with 2d6 rooms abandoned cemetery an abandoned lookout tower with 1d4 rooms an abandoned stronghold, 1d3 levels with 2d6 rooms per level. So that'd be pretty big if you run into that. A dungeon small, 1d6 rooms. Dungeon large, 3d20 rooms. An abandoned campsite. An abandoned village with 1d8 structures. And an abandoned farm. And then of course my terrain features because we're going to get into that map because we don't have a map. Um, we're going to make the map as we go. And terrain features, I got 1D12, 1 through 5, I got heavy forest, 6, light forest, 7, field, tall grass, 8, field, short grass, 9, swamp, 10, hills, 11, mountains, 12, marsh. And of course, I got my weather chart here to go with that. I use 1D6, 1 is fair, 2 is cloudy, 3 is rain, light. Four is rain heavy, negative one sight. So that would negative one to spot checks, sight checks, whatever you want to call them. Fog light, negative one to sight. Fog heavy, negative three to sight. And then of course, I also incorporate the moon phase. Crescent one, half two, full, which gives them a plus one to sight at night. And of course, my other two moon phases. So I just wanted to show you guys that. All right. Uh, we got that out of the way. Okay, first thing, solo RPG Palladium Fantasy. Let's get introduced to the characters. So, for my solo RPG, um, I have made two character classes. First one, which is this guy right here. He is a human ranger. His name is Denebe Stormcloud. And... Um, as you can see, let's go through some of his um, skills that he has. He has animal husbandry, land navigation. Um, he can ID plants and fruits. He knows how to prepare animal hides. He can track and trap animals. He knows how to track humans across wilderness. He has wilderness survival. Um, archery for weapon proficiency. His other weapon proficiency will be a, a knife, which pertains to a dagger. Hand-to-hand -hand basic combat, espionage, detect an ambush, which is always good, 
horsemanship general, which means he knows how to care and um, put a bit and bridle on a horse, how to take care of a horse and ride them. Medical first aid, which is always important. Another weapon proficiency for a sword, which I get a plus one to strike. Medical whole stick medicine, which means he can find herbs and plants and stuff and make cures. And then athletics, which I explained that to you in the other part of the video. Um, and my second character is Rowan Lockard. He is a human longbowman. And let's go over his skills. His skills, he has athletics, he has sniper, which gives him a plus two bonus to longbows, wilderness survival, archery as a weapon proficiency, targeting as a weapon proficiency, which gives him a plus one to all missiled weapons. He also has a weapon proficiency with a dagger, hand-to-hand -hand combat, another weapon proficiency slot for a sword, Espionage, escape artist. He knows how to get out of a tight spot. Pretty good. He has medical first aid. He has wilderness land navigation, so he knows how to navigate areas. Concealment, which will be to hide. He knows how to blend into his environment quite well and disappear. Prowl, which means he knows how to sneak up on people. And streetwise, he has smarts. So when he's in a uh, city area, he knows how to compose himself and how to sniff out trouble, so to speak. So we're introduced to the characters and I have um, decided to go with this guy right here. I don't know if you can see him underneath that light or not. And this right here is my ranger. And this guy right here is my bowman. All right. So, and of course I'll be using the emulator and all that. Um, but the first thing to do with solo RPG, and I've explained this before. Now I just gotta get it myself. Is we gotta set the scene. Now I've been thinking about this most of today. How to set the scene. Ha ha, piece of paper. So first thing I'm gonna do, is right scene number one and as I'm writing this I'm going to explain it to you guys so on the borders of the northern wilderness on the borders Of the northern wilderness there's going to be a small town I'm going to call uh, what the heck Tarthus small town named Tarthus Now, there's a very rich and influential, uh, how do I put this, aristocrat, aristocrat figure that owns this town. And with winter rapidly getting ready to close in because it's late fall, there is some ingredients he needs. And... Um, well, he says he needs them, but more than likely, he's going to sell them to make profit to other magic users, or perhaps maybe um, a magic user needs a spell to do for him. Either way, uh, he decided to pay us very handsomely to go into the wilds of the north and gather some of these items for him and bring them back. Now he needs the ranger because the ranger knows what he's looking for. And the ranger is going to take the bowman with him to, so to speak, to watch his back. Because it's just supposed to be a simple two day out, two day back journey and the payoff. And that's where scene one starts. We leave the 
village of Tarthus, um, I'm going to say early morning, and heading out towards the northern wilderness with all our provisions and everything we already have. Now, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my weather chart. Let's see what our weather is like for our journey on our first day. We're going to roll a d6. Four. We got heavy rain coming down on us. We have a negative one to sight. Ah, it's not good, but what can we do, right? So we trudge out in the rain and the muck towards the northern wilderness and a heavy wet rain as it's pouring down upon us. Now, how I do my travel in time, okay? is um, how I like to do it is roll a 1d4 four times once for every quarter of a mile um, no I'm sorry I told you wrong I told you wrong I like to, for to roll a 1d4 and it'll tell you how many hours have elapsed with travel time now with travel time how I'm gonna figure that is they're on foot so I'm going to say they're able to complete, uh, given their circumstance, um, roughly, we'll say three miles an hour. That, that sounds about right. I mean, they, um, yeah, we'll say three miles an hour. Hmm. They've been in it for four hours. So they're tired. They're ready to camp down for the night. And let's go back to the book. Because the first thing I want to do. Now how I like to do mine. Um, you know everybody's different. This is the way I like to do mine. I like to roll my percentage die and see what the percentage is of an encounter. The higher the result, the higher the percentage. The lower, the lower. Okay, I got a 19%, so it's pretty low. There's no encounters. The weather's horrible. There's not a lot out. Um, boy, what a way to start out an adventure. So... Let's turn to the mythic emulator and see. Ah, ha, ha. All right. Considering there's not much out, I'm gonna say we're at an average. So, um, using their wilderness skill, okay. This is how I'm going to do this. So they got Wilderness Survival, um, Track and Trap Animals. Uh, what do I want to go with here? I think, I think I'm going to go with Wilderness Survival. I got a plus 50% with him. And I want to see if I can see any like possibly man-made structures to take shelter in for the evening. So. I'm gonna add that 50% to my roll, which is 53, so that's like 103. And if we look at the chart here, do I see any man-made structures? We'll go down to 100. Um, that's gonna be a yes. Yeah, he spots a structure off into the distance. Now let's see what kind of structure it is. Oh. One thing I forgot to do, one thing I forgot to do after our four hours of traveling, what kind of terrain are features are we traveling in? So let's roll a 1d12, let's see, a five, heavy forest, huh. all right, um, ruins, so I'm going to roll my percentage again, let's see 
what's the outline that we see for shelter for the evening? 15%. Mmm. Well, he spots something and, um, I'm going to say, because here is the heavily wooded area, right? And they're coming through this way. Here's my ranger. Now he spots something up over here. And uh, he's going to try to take a closer look. Now I'm going to use my roll. I'm going to go with his um, IQ. Okay, so we're going to roll a 20 cider. Now, to see if he can actually make out in the rain, negative one of what he's looking at. So I want to try to get 13 or less to stay within my attribute. If I go above that, I've gone beyond my tribute. It's, okay, 12 plus one, 13, he hits it right on. We couldn't have gone luckier than that. So, even with the heavy rain, his eyes make out what he sees um, with the fading light. It's a cave system. And it's an entrance to a cave, which means, well, no rain, possibly some um, dry timber, sticks like that to build a fire and get warm. So, we're going to put scene two, the cave. So, it's starting to get dark. They're getting hungry. They're cold wet, tired, and they're approaching the cave. Now, the question's going to be, is there anything in the cave? So let's go to the mythic and see. And as he peers in, does he see anything? Does he see movement? Does he see anything in there? 86. Uh-oh. Something, in fact, is moving inside the cave. Okay. Well, huh. Let's see what's moving inside the cave. And I'm going to roll my percentage. <clears throat> so I got a 50. And... 0, 1 to 50 is the owl thing. So let's go to that page and pull up the owl thing. And look at their characteristics. Okay. Owl things are strange little creatures that resemble long-legged owls with large, rolling, yellow-green eyes. More intelligent than true owls, they are far more man's equal. However, owl things do possess a rudimentary intelligence and emotions. They roam the grasslands and parched earth of the old kingdom in the beg or wastelands on foot, trying to wing only to escape predators. They generally avoid, avoid large humanoids except to steal an occasional meal 
or glittering trinket trinket sorry i'm eating doritos so kind of getting stuck in there they are obsessed with collecting bright and shiny objects risking life and limb in the object be deemed worthy such object objects can range from brilliant valuable gemstones, gold or jewelry, to worthless sparkling rocks, glass, or junk. The treasure hoards are generally buried among the dry grass, sticks, and leaves of the nest, which are hidden under rocks, logs, or the protective arms of a cactus. A nest is often near or even shared with a much more ferocious beast, as an owl thing can psionically communicate and manipulate animals thus even the most aggressive predator will accept it as one of its own and fight to protect it okay well here's one of the things both my guys have lanterns and um we have to see if this thing deems it worthy to attack them for their lantern So, let's go to the fate chart. Okay. Does the owl thing notice their lantern? Now, I'm going to move my chaos rank up one above average because there is an encounter now. Let's see. 70%. Yes, exceptionally. So the owl thing does notice the reflection, reflecting glitteriness off the low light that's setting on the land of the glass of their lanterns at the sides. I want that. So, the owl thing is going to step out of the shadows and try to attack. Now, it gets three physical attacks, which is just horrible. A bite and two claws. Ugh. Let's see what it's... Oh man, it's SD. Structural damage capacity is pretty high. So with that, structural damage capacity is 4d6. One, two, three, four, five, six. Well, that, um, I guess that's in the favor for me. SDC six and has twelve HP. Okay, guys, here's gonna go combat round one. Oh, I forgot to get a creature for the owl thing. We better get that. That's very important. perfect thing for that. So out of the shadow of the cave steps this horrid creature. And of course, they don't know any different because its beak is trying to reach for the lantern. They just perceive it as an attack. So at this point, um, let's roll initiative and see who goes first. So, here is the owl thing, a 13, and then my guys, 13. Huh. So, roll off. Let's do that again. Owl thing, 13. My guys, 9. Okay. So, the owl thing reaches out and snaps at the lantern.
Now the question is, does he actually get, let me see how I want to do this. He's going to have to roll pretty high to grab a hold of that. Yeah, I say let's do that. So he is, I'm going to include that as his armor rating just to put a... Thirteen, so we'll see if the little sucker, if he rolls a thirteen or better, he'll actually grab a hold of his lantern from his belt. Oh, and he did. He snaps, grabs hold of the lantern. So he's kind of like over this way, latched onto his lantern, which doesn't make him very happy. So now, at this point. It's his turn to attack, which is what I would do. And what do I want? He's going to use the sword. He gets a plus one to strike. And because of his hand to hand, he gets two attacks per round, which is very cool. Now, um,. Because I have a high physical score, high physical strength, a tribute of 24, I get a plus 8 to hand to hand. So I get a plus 9 to my roll. So let's roll that. That's a 19. That's well above, um, obviously, 5. So... Now I'm going to go into the damage phase of this. And he's using his scimitar, which is 2d6 damage. Oh, I should get another six-sider. Is that one? Was seeming to roll a little low. And that would be five. So, he has rolled five damage. Now, in the case of this owl thing, because he's latched onto his lantern, I don't think he's going to have much of a choice to strike or parry or anything like that. The structural damage capacity is six. So, I did a total of five. So, it takes it down to one. So he has one structural damage capacity left, and then we start chipping away at the hit points. But he gets another attack. His second attack, obviously, eight to his hand-to-hand, -hand, plus his one natural, which is nine. Now, I gotta roll a four or higher. Oh, I rolled a one. Well, but plus nine is ten I still hit that's what I love about this game okay because you also have to add in all your bonuses to that roll so um, it's gonna be really hard to um, evade his attack so I'm going to now let's see Actually, I'm going to leave it up to the dice rather than the fate chart. I'm going to roll a percentage die. If I roll high, the owl thing is going to let go of the lantern and try to um, parry his attack. Not parry his attack, but more or less, I guess you would consider it a dodge of his attack. Try to back away from the attack. If he rolls low... Um, he's not giving up on that lantern. 41, he rolls low. He's not giving up on that lantern. So here we go. 
six, seven, eight, eight damage. So now, uh, let me get my sheet here. His structural damage capacity has been reduced to zero, which is seven. So now he's gonna take seven points of damage against his hit points. Which will leave him at five. That was my ranger who is currently um, trying to free himself of, of this owl thing that's latched onto the lantern because whatever reason. Um, now it's my long bowman's turn and he's gonna use his bow. Um, he's gonna draw that sucker out because you can see it in plain sight. Um, the same as my ranger, he gets two attacks per turn. Uh, his physical strength is 26. And if I remember correctly, um, hold on a sec, guys. I forgot to put in his strike bonus. I made my character. It's funny. When I made that character, I knew I missed something on it. And I went over it, went over it. I was sitting there talking with my wife while I was making the character. And, uh, yeah, I did forget something. No, I'm good. I got everything. Okay. I am good. So. Oh, wait a minute. I know where I messed up. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. I don't mean to. He gets targeting. That's what he gets. Plus one. Plus of his. Um, his weapon proficiency. He gets. Uh, plus two to strike. So he gets a total of plus three. For two arrows, all well, two attacks. So his first attack at a plus three is a seven, which hits. Boom. His longbow does 2d6 damage, which is a seven. And needless to say, he doesn't need to take another um, arrow because that arrow killed beast dead. So this creature is done. It's off the board. Um, now, here's the question. He kills the beast and then latches its beak from and its now crushed lantern with broken glass and he peers into the cave. Does he see anything else moving? 76. Yes. There's something else moving around in there. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, well it's good it didn't um, use its psionic blast. Can the character see an outline of what's in there? likely so let's go back to his IQ Just 13 so if he rolls higher than the 13 he doesn't know what he's looking at if he rolls lower than 13 he's gonna see it 
He sees it. He sees the silhouette of a large grizzly bear. So. Boy, if that thing would have called psionically to that thing, this would have been horrible. Or maybe for the fact that he did so much damage the first time with the first attack, maybe it just stunned him. I don't know. Okay. Now he sees the grizzly bear. Question is, does the grizzly bear notice them no holy crap we're lucky so the grizzly bear is stirring and moving around inside the cave but so far is unaware of their presence um, I'm going to say at this point, it's time to get the heck out of Dodge and get away from here and, um, leave that thing be. Hopefully it'll eat the owl thing and forget all about us. So, one character has Prowl. So, which is... My long bowsman. He notices him waving at him just to leave, 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 leave. And you can tell by his um, <clears throat> his body language that um, it's he's being a very, very quiet, hushed, motioning to him to leave, leave, leave. So he knows he's got to be somewhat quiet about what he's doing. So he's going to use Prowl, his skill. He gets 25%. So he's rolled a 24. So 49%. I'm going to remember that. 49%. Now, unfortunately, my human ranger does not have Prowl. So we're going to use his physical prowess. If he rolls higher than this, um, he's kind of clumsy. And then at that point, that grizzly bear is going to get a, an opportunity to notice our presence. So I'm going to say for him, he's kind of moved over to here. He's getting ready to turn to move. He rolled a 13. His physical prowess is 15. So luckily, he quietly crept away. Now, remember that number I told you about? The uh, 49%? I want to see if the bear heard anything. Zero, nine percent. The bear didn't hear anything. The bear was completely, I can't believe that, completely oblivious to our presence. And um, at that point, um, we keep trudging along in the rain for another hour. It's now um, well after nightfall and um, my ranger no longer has a lantern because the lantern's been destroyed. I do believe my long bowman, bowman does have a lantern so they're gonna have to share a lantern. No, he doesn't have a lantern. So they're kind of wandering around in the wilderness in the dark. Um, and everything's soaking wet. So the whole thought of making a torch is going to be... Uh -uh. Um, let me see. I'm going to... I'm just going to use... Uh, do another spot check here. See if they... 
because they're both humans. They're not elves or dwarves or anything like that. So they don't get any infrared vision or anything. They're they're kind of like in like a really bad way right now. Um, his IQ. I'm gonna roll and see if he can see anything as far as cover for the evening. Nope, he don't see Jack Squat. Um, so I'm gonna say the best thing that they do is after about an hour, they take refuge in the woods underneath a large tree and um, pull them cloaks around themselves. And let me see what if the weather has changed. Let's see. We're going to go on average roll here. 55%. Um, somewhat 50-50. I hate when it does that. Okay, so we'll say I'll roll the percentage die. If it's high, there's a high chance that the weather has changed. If it's low, it's still storming. 29%. It's still just raining hard, pouring down. Um... So the best thing they can do is just pull the clo their hooded cloaks around them, try to stay as warm as possible, and wait the night out. So, is they're all nice and, um, we'll say, squatted underneath the tree to try to get some um, relief from this weather. I'm going to see how I'm, I'm going to roll a four cider and this is going to be for how many hours have passed. So two hours have passed. I'm also going to roll my percentage die. 50%. Mm, no, they haven't ran into any encounters. I'm going to say another five hours will be daylight. Another hour has passed. So we're into hour two, 68%. Um, there's an encounter. So... Ooh, yeah, that ain't gonna be good. So, um, as they're huddled up underneath this tree, trying to stay warm, and it's now getting into the very early hours of the morning. It's miserable, it's cold, heavy rain. They hear a familiar sound. They hear the sound of wolves howling. Now the question is, do the wolves, with all the rain, pick up their scent? That is the question. So, let's see. I'm going to go back to using the fate chart again here, guys. And uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to go with average because it is a heavy rain. So we'll see if the wolves pick up their scent or not in the rain. 7%. No, they don't. So with the heavy rain and the ground being soaked, um, the wolves are unable to pick up their scent trail. They hear them, and let's just see. I'm just curious how many. They hear a pack of about seven wolves that pass. Um, that would be a bit close. Let me reroll that. You know, about 70 yards or so from their location. They hear a pack of wolves go by, um, howling and doing what wolves do. That was close. That would have been, that would have been pretty ugly. All right, that was hour two out of five. Three hours left before daylight. Four hours have passed. Um, no encounter, 
let's see I'm gonna say it's a new day the weather has changed or we hope that it has changed and let's see what the weather is shall we one fair so we had a day of rain and as the daylight starts to light up the sky and we're soaked and cold and freaking miserable the sun at last is shining and shining light over the rugged wilderness of the north and that was that was something that was really really something um i hope this gives you guys a decent um look into palladium fantasy um what palladium fa fantasy is and uh you know hopefully this is something you guys might find uh interesting want to pick up and get into a little bit more now obviously um this little go about here um you know took about an hour and of course i'm going to continue to keep playing um palladium fantasy and, and keep going but i just wanted to show you guys a demonstration of the game show you how it was played some of the mechanics it was pretty cool with the owl thing because you guys got to see and uh now you understand with um the battle matrix how well it works out it's really geared towards the heroes of the game now i'm not gonna say um your characters are always going to um win at everything because uh that in fact is not the truth uh you know you're gonna meet some encounters in this world that are uh, pretty better than you but for most part, um, I think this went really well um, for a little homebrew adventure and a demonstration for you guys. You know, give you a little snippet into the northern wilderness and um, what my characters encountered. And and I'll tell you what, it lived up to its name. Um, that's kind of rough when you lose your light source out in the middle of the wilderness. But it is what it is. And... Um, so with that being said, guys, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I plan on doing more videos like this and demonstrating some more games so you guys have a better idea of what's out there. All right, and uh, if uh, don't forget, if you like uh, the content, please don't forget to like or subscribe to the channel. It'd be very much appreciated. And um, as always, you know, thank all you guys and all my people that have supported me from the beginning from the bottom of my heart thanks a lot that's what keeps me um, wanting to make these videos because um, believe me um, I'd still be gaming whether I was recording it or not <laughs> but it may feels good to know that uh, there's a group of like-minded people out there like me that enjoy solo RPG and enjoy different game systems and such like that and uh, you know with that being said, guys, um, I think this video is going to be a wrap for this session, and that was Palladium Fantasy. <laughs>